Amen. It is fantastic to see you on this beautiful evening. I try to stay away from politics. I really do. Especially when preaching, because you know, everybody has their own idea. And at any, any time, point in time, when a preacher decides to pontificate about politics, there's a good chance that he's going to lose at least half of his congregation in that particular sermon, if not more. Well, tonight, I'm not trying to make any kind of value statements. I just simply want us all together from a biblical perspective to realize that the Bible tells us exactly what's going to happen next. Now, most of us are smart enough that we have figured it out, but the Bible's going to tell us anyway. Because you see, when the Bible does talk about what we would consider politics, I get the right to talk about it. And then it doesn't matter who I offend because it's from the Bible. And it's not me that's doing the offending. It is the Scripture. Now, we understand, whether we like it or not, that the Bible does not endorse a particular type of government. Now, you may not like that. You may not like me to say that. You may, as a, a good, solid American, believe that the republic we have is the best form of government that could possibly be thought of on the planet, and that might actually be the truth. But understand that that is not endorsed anywhere in your Bibles. And instead of trying to find an endorsement for you in your Bible, simply admit that it is a Greek idea and that you happen to like it and just go forward. That's okay. Not everything you like has to be endorsed by the Scripture. And the Scripture does not endorse a particular type of government. Now, it does speak against a godless government, but honestly, in the Old Testament period, almost every government was somehow or another related to the religious belief in that particular area. So they included God of some type. So the idea of a godless government, from the standpoint that there would be no God, doesn't exist in the scripture. That's a very modern communistic idea. Second thing, and that kind of goes along with, with our church conference that we're going into tonight. You know, we as Baptists, we are people of the book. We love to look in the book and how is it that we are supposed to operate. And, and, and you know, one of the first things that I learned growing up a long time ago is that if we try to find Baptist polity or any other church type polity endorsed in the New Testament, you know, we're straining at gnats. We just have to admit that this is our particular tradition and this is the way we do things. And that's okay. Because every other church out there has to end up doing the same thing, whether they're Presbyterian, Methodist, Pentecostal, Catholic, whatever they may be, the way that they conduct their business, nobody has an endorsement from the New Testament on how to do that. Not exactly. We have some, but not entirely. With those thoughts in mind, we're going to look at the fact that you and I do not live in such a postmodern era after all. We think that we live in a time that is unique in history. There is nothing unique about us and there's you nothing unique about our time. You say, well, sure it is. We live, we live in that time when as soon as something goes wrong, people run to the government. Well, guess what? We have a Bible example that there is nothing new under the sun. I'd like you to take your Bibles with me tonight, and I would like you to turn with me to the Old Testament book of Genesis. We are doing a uh, sermon series during the first part of the sermon called Interesting Phenomena from the Bible. Interesting Phenomena from the Bible, and we are majoring on the Old Testament. 
Genesis chapter 41. Genesis chapter 41. You are familiar with these stories? As a matter of fact, I would dare say that there's a good chance because you and I grew up hearing these particular stories that we are so familiar with them that we actually miss some of the details. So I want to give you some of those details tonight by way of reminder. It is the story of Joseph and the great famine. Now you will remember that God had sent Pharaoh a vision that Joseph interpreted. Actually, there were two visions or two dreams. The one about the cows and, and the other ones about the grain heads. About the number of good years and the number of lean years to follow. Now, I want you to notice something. You can go back through this and read it. God told Pharaoh what was going to happen. Told him what was going to happen. What God did not tell Pharaoh was what to do about it. And it took a Jew. It took a Jew to come up with the idea that was come up with. And unfortunately, the Jew that introduced this idea, a man by the name of Joseph, one of our great heroes, has poisoned the well for us ever since the book of Genesis. Follow along with the story, if you will. We're just going to read bits and parts of it. Genesis chapter 41 we're going to begin in verse number 33 and read through verse number 36. This is Joseph speaking. Now therefore let Pharaoh select a wise man and set him over all the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh proceed to appoint overseers over the land and take one-fifth of the produce, that's 20%, of Egypt during the seven plentiful years. Now let's stop right there. We, we automatically know that for any government to exist, taxes already existed. So now Joseph is increasing that tax amount by how much we don't know exactly. But he gives Pharaoh an incentive to raise taxes. Only a Jew could think of that. Here we go. 20%. And let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh for food in the cities and let them keep it. That food shall be reserved for the land against the seven years of famine that are to occur in the land of Egypt so that the land may not perish during the famine. Now that's pretty cool so far. Pretty cool so far. But it gets a whole lot better. Chapter 41 beginning in verse number 56. I want you to see what Joseph did with all that taxes. So when the famine had spread over all the land, Joseph opened all the storehouses and he sold it to the Egyptians. Now who paid those taxes? The Egyptians did, by 20%. Joseph didn't run a soup kitchen. Joseph's idea was simple. Here's what we're going to do, Pharaoh. We're going to tax the people, and then we're going to turn around, and we're going to sell it to the people that we taxed. We're going to sell them back what they paid in. Because Joseph had a scheme in mind, and Pharaoh loved Joseph. There's no doubt why. You know, we, we always tell the kids he was made second in command of Pharaoh and he marched around and people bowed down to him and he wrote, uh, he had Pharaoh's ring and he rode in Pharaoh's chariot and it sounds so cool. We forget to tell him why that he, Pharaoh did that. He did that because Joseph was going to give him sole authority over the land and the people of Egypt. Joseph came up with a system. Now, not God. Don't think God did this. God gave the vision, you're going to have seven good years, you're going to have seven bad years. God didn't tell him how to take care of it. Joseph came up with that plan. And Joseph's plan to take care of it was let us centralize authority and let us, in centralizing that authority, Make the government, who is Pharaoh, make the government rich, 
give the government control of all of the people of the land of Egypt. That was Pharaoh's reason for loving Joseph. You say, no, no, wait a second. I ain't never heard that. Okay, so let's read the Bible. So when the fa famine had spread over all the land, Joseph opened up the storehouses and he sold to the Egyptians for the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Moreover, all the earth came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe over all the earth. Now turn with me, if you would, to chapter 47. Chapter 47. This is a little bit longer passage, but I really need you to follow with me as we read it all. Because it kind of sums up what takes place. Chapter 47, beginning in verse number 13. Now there was no food in all the land, for the famine was very severe. So that the land of Egypt and the land of Cana languished by reason of the famine. And Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Cana. How did he gather up all the money? He sold the food to them. That's how he gathered up all the money. First of all, he took their money. But now he's going to do something else. In exchange for the grain that they bought. And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. That's the way of saying he, he brought it into the coffers of the government. And when the money was all spent in the land of Egypt and in the land of Cana, and all the Egyptians came to Joseph and they said, Give us food. Why should we die before your, hour, before your eyes? Our money is gone. And Joseph answered, Give your livestock and I will give you food in exchange for your livestock if your money's gone. All right, so now let's think about this. These guys were, were, were farmers and the like. So what he's doing is he's, first of all, he taxed their produce. Then he took their money. Now he's going to take all their produce. But there's more. So they brought all the livestock to Joseph. And Joseph gave them food in exchange for their horses, their flocks, their herds, and their donkeys. He supplied them with food in exchange for all their livestock that year. And when that year was ended, they came to him the following year and they said to him, We will not hide from my Lord that our money is all spent. The herds of our livestock are all my Lord's. There is nothing left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our land. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? By us and our land for food and we with our land will be servants to Pharaoh and give us seed that we may live and not die and that the land may not be destitute so Joseph bought all of the land of Egypt for Pharaoh for all of the Egyptians sold their fields because the famine was severe the land became Pharaoh's as for the people Joseph made them servants from one end of Egypt to the other end. Only the land of the priest did he not, did not buy. For the priest had a fixed allowance from Pharaoh and lived on the allowance that Pharaoh gave them. Therefore, they did not sell their land. You see what happened here? Do you hear this? God told Pharaoh... There's going to be a famine. Joseph interpreted the dream. Then Joseph came up with a plan of how to take care of that famine. And what that plan included was the subjugation of the entire land and people and money of Egypt so that everything and everyone belonged to Pharaoh. He was Pharaoh's right-hand man. Pharaoh loved that Jew called Joseph. It's as simple as that. People have been going to their government in times of crises since Genesis. Do not think, do not think that it is anything new 
when Americans turn to their government in times of crisis to bail them out. I've actually been wanting to preach this particular passage for quite a few weeks. I am not here to make value judgments. I am here to tell you what is going to happen next from a biblical perspective. A crisis was created in the United States. To a certain degree, that crisis was artificial. The virus was not artificial, but there was a reaction to the virus that came from the government itself, not from the people, but from the government. And the government shut everything down. The result of that was thousands, millions of people without work, without means of, pers of resourcing themselves. So the government, in the midst of a crisis, came up with a plan. Now, I'm not giving you value statements. I'm just telling you the facts. And y'all know the facts. Because every single one of us received a check from the government. Now, we live in a country where the government already owns all of our land. So we, we don't have a Joseph to, first of all, take our money and then take our livestock and then take our land. Our land already belongs to the United States. All you do is lease your land from the government. That is it. And anyone here who thinks otherwise doesn't own anything. Because we all pay property tax. And what is property tax except a lease from the government? Because if you quit paying your property tax, what happens? They take your land. Only the owner can take the land. So they already own your land. You don't own no land. You lease it from the United States government. You lease it from the local government, however you want to put it. But a crisis is created. An economic crisis is created. There were truly people who didn't have enough money. I, I'm, I'm not saying that anything about unemployment insurance. I'm not saying anything about uh, them getting money to help them through. No value statement at all. But all of us received those checks. Now, as far as I know, none of us denied taking it and sent it back. I tithed on mine, and then I saved the rest of it to send to the state of South Carolina for my quarterly taxes. Hey, why not? But I want you to understand the principle involved with Joseph. The principle involved with Joseph is that nothing is free. Someone has to pay for everything. Joseph did not collect the food through the taxes to turn around and freely give it to the Egyptians. Now we all knew that he sold it to the Canaanites. But most of us had either forgotten or never knew or didn't remember that Joseph sold it to the Egyptians themselves until they were penniless, and then he took their resources, which were their livestock and their land. And then he even took themselves. In the midst of a crisis, we all received checks. Somebody's got to pay for that. Money ain't free. They already own all the land. So there's only one way that the government can recoup that money that they sent to all of us. Only one way. Only one way. Since they can't take our land and most of us don't have any livestock, the only recourse they have is to raise taxes. There is no other way around it. It is going to happen. It has to happen. 
that money has to be replaced. But now here's the deal. When they raise those taxes to get all that money back that they gave us, how many of you here think that those taxes are ever going down again? In every crisis situation, when the people cry out to their government for help, and I'm not saying it's not real, obviously it's real. The end result is the people lose more and more and more control. And the government gains more and more control over its people with every crisis that comes when the people ask the government to take care of them in the midst of the crisis. That is just a fact of history. No value statement is being given, not by this preacher. Nor am I entering into a political discussion with you about it. I am simply saying, the Bible tells me what's going to happen next. And since they can't take your land, they're going to take your money. You can trust me. Would you pray with me? Lord God, you tell us all about the future from the past. You show us how people respond in a crisis. You show us how people gain control over other people in the midst of that crisis. You show us how governments can take control in the midst of a crisis. And amazingly, even some of the heroes of the faith are used in that in that entire process because we know that your Bible is, is not giving us a roadmap or a stamp for what kind of government we ought to have. It's just telling us what will happen with our governments regardless of what type it is. Lord, sometimes we need to pray, save us from ourselves. Sometimes we need to pray that you would give us the eyes to see from the scripture that these stories that we have been learning our whole life have application in real everyday life if we will simply make that application. We praise you for your holy, holy word and we thank you for Jesus Christ our Savior. We pray, Father, for those who might be in harm's way this week with the riots around the nation, particularly here in our own state and in our own city of Columbia. We pray for the protection of Brad DeRocher. We pray, Father, that if Cullen Miller gets called up with the National Guard that you would protect him and all of the other servicemen and the MPs that have already been employed. Lord, we pray that your grace will reign upon us and we pray that those who are angry and violent will be stopped. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen.